Baker, you may have come across because he's a, a prolific commentator on CNN, uh, as well as writing for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and in Britain, The Guardian. Uh, and uh, he, he is renowned for tackling difficult subjects uh, and tackling them with a cool head and um, using reason instead of passion. And he, he has a new book coming out, but it isn't going to appear until October. And so we are getting a sneak preview tonight of what's it all about. And um, I'll give you the titles just to, so you have an idea. The title is, We Have Never Been Woke. Social justice dis discourse, inequality, and the rise of a new elite. And that's going to be published by uh, Princeton University Press. So this is Musa al Ghabi in his own words. My goal is to convey complicated ideas and information to people in a way that's concise, compelling, and accessible. I try to tell audiences things that they need to hear, but don't necessarily want to hear. To help the medicine go down, I try to engage folks in terms of their own values, their own priorities, narratives, and frames of reference. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we give you Musa al -Ghabi. Woo! Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to, uh, to be here. Um, so because I'm a professor, um, I feel like I have to start my talk today uh, with a little bit of a pop quiz. Um, so uh, it's not a hard quiz. So uh, uh, behind me on the screen, you should see two lines. And you can see at the beginning, the two lines are closer together, where you see this kind of uh, dotted pattern. And then they grow further apart. Um, if you had to evaluate which of these two lines shifted more, which one is more responsible for the fact that they are further apart now than they used to be, which one would you say shifted more? You can just shout it out. Amen. Great, great. OK, so let's try it again. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, similar. You see two lines. They're close together. They grow further apart. Which one is responsible? B, great, great. See, the thing is, is when the, when, the, when the pictures are like this in black and white, and when you have generic titles like A and B, no one would mistake what's going on in these pictures. But then something really funny happens when you start adding, uh, when you start coloring the lines red or blue, or adding labels to the lines like Democrat and Republican. All of a sudden, things that are really obvious that anyone can just look at the picture and see become really tough for people to see, including for fancy nerds like myself. Um, so if you look at the, um, so the first image I showed you was from an essay by a political scientist that was published in the New York Times. I think you can see the original picture behind me. Um, and uh, what, the, what the graph shows you is the Democratic and Republican Party platforms from 2000 to 2016. And so you can see that uh, after 2008, at 2008, the parties were kind of close together. 2012, the Republicans shifted a little bit more to the right, but then in 2016, they kind of moderated. Um, but the parties grew further apart than ever. Why? Because of changes in the blue line. Democrats, after 2012, shifted way, way, way far to the left, and they continued in that trajectory after 2016. But if you read this article called What Happened to America's Political Center of Gravity, what you'll hear is the reason the, um, uh, that there is no center of gravity in America today is because Republicans went crazy. Um, so the uh, author, who's a, who's a, he's a great political scientist, but he produced this graph <laughs> that shows this picture. It's his central part of his argument. And the editors looked at this picture and the people who are citing this article looked at this picture and all came away thinking, yeah, Republicans, they're the ones. <laughs> um, and then so the, the, the second picture I showed you is, um, oh, can you, next slide, please. 
is from uh, an article in the Washington Post called, uh, by another political scientist called Tom Wood. It's called Racism uh, Motivated Trump Voters More Than Authoritarianism, which in itself is already like an interesting way to kind of structure the article. There's this whole kind of genre in the social sciences that runs something like this. Which negative trait best explains why someone voted for Trump? Is it that they're more racist or sexist or authoritarian? Like if someone had done a similar article, like why would someone vote for Hillary Clinton? Is it that they're communists or atheists or they hate America? We would immediately be like, flag on the play. That's a biased study design. But when you're studying Trump voters, you can do things like this all the time. And it seems perfectly reasonable and normal. So um, what the lines on this chart show you uh, they're supposed to measure what sociologists call symbolic racism. There's a lot of problems with that measure. We can just set them to the side. Let's pretend that what the graphs show you is whether or not Democrats or Republicans embrace racist attitudes. Okay, so what you can see is that in 2016, the gap between Democrats and Republicans is bigger than ever before. So on this basis, uh, the political scientists wrote, so therefore race must have played a bigger role in this election than in any other cycle. Sure, fine, reasonable. But then he continues, and therefore, Trump voters must have been motivated by racism. <laughs> the problem with that is when you look at his own chart, his own data, you can see actually that from 2012 to 2016, Republicans became less likely to endorse racist sentiments. So that is, Trump voters were less racist than Romney voters. They're moving in the same direction as the Democrats. The reason the gap is bigger than ever before is because you saw this rapid shift on the blue line. Democrats became less likely to endorse these views than any time going back to 1988. They became less likely to endorse these views when they had a black candidate on the ballot from their own party, America's first black candidate, uh, black president, Barack Obama. In fact, when Obama was on the ballot, Democrat endorsement of racism actually went up a little bit, which is really interesting. It's completely unanalyzed in the literature, and there's a reason for that. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is it's not just on these identity issues. On issue after issue, once you start seeing this trend, you can't not see it. So there's a lot of polarization around expertise. Why is there polarization around expertise? Who shifted more? It's the blue line. <laughs> um, if you look at uh, Gallup put this thing together, looking at different issues where Americans have grown apart um, since the year 2000. And what you can see is that for the vast majority of issues where Americans are further apart than they used to, it's because of shifts on the blue line. The blue line shifted a lot more than the red line. But if you read academic articles, or if you read mainstream media newspapers, that is not the impression that you'll get. The impression that you'll get is the reason why there's a lot more polarization around expertise or identity and things like this is because those right-wingers have lost their minds. Um, and there's a reason for that. So next slide. Um, so this is a study, that I, uh, uh, an essay that I wrote for an organization I'm affiliated with called Heterodox Academy. And what you can see, uh, what, and, and what this chart depicts, is um, how, uh, who comprises the professoriate in the United States. And so what you can see uh, from the chart is that professors are significantly more left-wing than the public as a whole, and they're significantly less likely to be moderates or conservatives compared to the public as a whole. And um, journalists are, are similar. Uh, elsewhere, I've done uh, similar studies for journalists. And so one effect of the, uh, and social scientists are even more left-leaning than academics as a whole. So fields like sociology, um, we outnumber uh, people on the left, outnumber people on the right, something like 11 to 1 or more. Um, and what happens in that context, when almost all of us are on the blue line, is when we want to understand some social problem, if we want to understand something like political polarization or um, increasing uh, 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 conflict over identity issues or um, crisis of expertise, we don't start by going, huh, why are we so weird? Or, uh, huh, what's wrong with us? We start by going, um, what's wrong with those people? We, we can correctly perceive that the distance between us and other people is growing. But our starting assumption isn't that we're changing, it's that those people are changing. And when we try to explain why other people disagree with us, we usually try to explain that by appeal to deficits or pathologies, so those people 
are uh, the reason they disagree with us, the reason why there's this tension over race is because those people are racist. The reason why there's tension over gender is because those people are sexist or misogynist. Um, and so on, and so the reason why there's tension over expertise is because those people are anti-intellectuals, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide. And so um, I started noticing, uh, after the Trump election, I started noticing uh, these kind of glaring errors, like the one I showed you in the first couple of charts, where people are like, here's my chart. It proves this, when you can just look at the chart and go, it's the opposite of that. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I started noticing a lot of these, uh, a lot of these glaring, glaring, blatant errors in the literature on Trump and Trump supporters. And I was talking about this to one of my uh, colleagues at Columbia, and he said, oh yeah, I see these kinds of papers all the time. I have a whole file drawer of them. And I was like, oh, we should write a paper about that together. And he was like, I will never do that, and you shouldn't either. <laughs> and, uh, because the thing is, is a lot of times, even when, because the field is so skewed to the left, even when people notice problems on the left, they often don't feel comfortable talking about them because our colleagues and peers, if you write something like, hey, you're analyzing Trump voters wrong, they go, oh, you must be a Trump supporter. Um, and, uh, and for a lot of us, if we're accused of being a Trump supporter, it's like a very dangerous thing, right? Like we, don't, we, we would hate that kind of um, accusation. Uh, but unbeknownst to my colleague, at the time when I was like, oh, we should write a paper on this together, and he was like, nah, um, I had, already had a, I had already written one paper on this topic <laughs> that was under review in a journal and it got published. It's called Race and the Race for the White House on Social Research in the Age of Trump. And it looks at how social scientists often study Trump and Trump voters in these prejudicial ways. But it wasn't enough to just uh, highlight how we kind of study people who are not like us in these prejudicial ways, because there's still this really interesting phenomenon. So if you look at those earlier charts, you see these dramatic shifts in the blue line. What's going on there? What motivated that? Why do you have that shift in the blue line to the extent that people like us contribute to social problems? How? How concretely do we contribute to social problems? How are we driving polarization? To the extent that, uh, to what extent are we aware of the ways that we contribute to social problems? Since a lot of my peers, didn't seem either, either weren't interested in these questions or didn't feel comfortable talking about them or publishing on them, I decided to just write a book <laughs> investigating those questions myself. And that's coming out um, October 7th with Princeton University Press. It's called, uh, as, as was announced, it's called We Have Never Been Woke, um, the, the Cultural Contradictions of a New Elite. Um, you can find out more about it on my website, musalgarbi.com. Uh, I think that's it for my time, so thank you so much for having me. Have a good night. <laughs>